Uh, yeah, my name is Nico and I run the Nico's Wings channel. It's got uh, just uh, broke 65,000 subscribers, about 5 million views or maybe a little more than that. I haven't checked uh, that as of lately, but uh, um, aviation is uh, something that I wanted to get into since I was a child. And, um, but I didn't get the chance to do it until I was actually a little later. I was uh, 38 when I started, I'm 50 now. Uh, I have clocked uh, since then about a couple thousand hours. Uh, I'm instrument rated, multi-engine rated. Uh, I'm a click away from being a commercial pilot, but never got that done. And um, the way I apply aviation is my mission is to fly for business. Um, and the Cirrus SR22 Turbo was a great uh, tool for me and my business. And uh, a lot of my flying that... Uh, is out there on my YouTube channel is all about the actual mission uh, of having to get there for business. Uh, and typically my uh, typical flights are a number of legs uh, through a certain number of days. Uh, it's, not, it's not just one single flight. Uh, it's typically a number of different flights, things that are not easy to do with the airlines and uh, or almost impossible to do with the airlines. Um, I fly across the country. Uh, I've gone to California a couple of times and back uh, on meetings. And uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, it is absolutely no better way to fly for business, uh, especially with what's going on right now. Although oh, there's really no business, but I was even able to fly during the COVID-19 crisis uh, up to Chicago and uh, bring a relative down to Florida um, that uh, a little more older. She, she was not comfortable with uh, um, going on the airlines. But anyway, the, the long story is that uh, aviation is basically um, uh, a tool that I use and the airplane is probably one of the most amazing, best investments I've ever done uh, uh, when you combine it with business and are able to use it. It's just, just fantastic. So that's, that's a little bit about me. What, uh, Nico, I, I kind of want to kick off the first question and, and uh, folks, you can feel free to unmute yourselves. I'll... Um click that on there so you can unmute yourself. But what would you say is behind the incredible growth and interest in your channel that, um, you know, where you've, you've taken, you know, I find myself sometimes like, even though I fly every day, <laughs> I still, you know, enjoy uh, sitting down and, and uh, after dinner or something and, you know, uh, relaxing and, and here I am watching you fly. <laughs> and the thing I need to do is be in an airplane again. But, um, what I find, what I find interesting, maybe you can expand upon, and is that you're taking your your viewers on a journey, and every journey is a little bit different. And and uh, uh, what do you suppose has been the reason your growth has been so organic, uh, and your versus so many others? Why do you think that is? And you know, first of all, I keep it simple. Um, I you know I'm very busy with work with family too. It's it's busy. Uh, my my business also was not really affected by the COVID nineteen crisis because we're all online. So we were actually busier than before. So, uh, but I I keep it really simple with the YouTube stuff. But I keep it real. That's that's the thing that I try to always do. I try to bring out. You know what I'll tell you. I don't know what the story is until I start editing the video. I, I'm like. Holy God, don't even remember that this actually happened. Wow. And then the story comes alive. And then my job is to bring it alive, to bring the, the viewer into the cockpit with me for, by me actually during the flight explain what's going on. If I didn't do a good job explaining it, putting a little narration together just to bring in the situation. And uh, with a, I believe with the right editing, the right combination of visuals, without being too geeky, although I am a geek, you know, without too much TMI, you know, but just keeping it simple, keeping it short, keeping the content going, flowing all across, uh, no big gaps of pauses, um, keeping it entertaining and good selection of music, I think brings a good product out. And uh, it takes a lot of time to produce those videos. The average video is about 20 hours of production time, but I absolutely love that I, I've been into video editing since I was a kid. Um, since I was using computers for the first time back in the 80s, 
so I, and, and music production and everything about that um, filmmaking kind of thing, it, it can always attract my interest. And I think I've been able to express that hobby and the creative aspect of it while also combining the, the real flying where it's a real mission. I don't make up the mission. I'm not gonna take the effort to go to Chicago just to go to Chicago and film. I film because I have a mission, you know? So um, yeah, you, that's how I'll go about it. You find yourself like, uh, I know I get kind of bored on long cross countries. If I'm by myself, I, I enjoy flying with other people. Do you find yourself um, having that audience with you that you know you're filming and you're being filmed that, um, you, you just find yourself having your, your, your audience with you on this journey, even though they're not there yet? Very, very good point. And that is actually very true because the fact that I actually go through the motions of not only filming, but explaining what's happening, like if somebody's in the cockpit right next to me um, and explaining what's going on, what I'm going through, where I'm at, I'm not filming all the time, right? Um, most of the flights are typically, you know, three, four hours long. There are long leg, long stretches. I'm not going to film three or four hours of video. That, I don't do that. That's impossible to maintain. Too, you know, too big. Those are the files that get huge. Plus, there's not enough battery, enough memory card on those on those cameras, right? So what I try to do, I try to keep it interesting by only filming the interesting parts, the departure, the weather situation, something odd that's going on. Um, you know, things of that nature. Uh, and yeah, it keeps it interesting. It keeps the, the flights more interesting because I actually have some to do. Uh, those transitions were actually will film with a zoom lens, um, zoom in on, a, on an, an airliner or zoom in on a, on a ship on the ocean or, or a river, you know, where the light is, is reflecting beautifully um, or the instruments and the close-ups of the instruments. It keeps it interesting, you know. Uh, there's only so many Netflix uh, <laughs> movies you can watch uh, on autopilot. <laughs> That's cool. Um, well, there, you're getting some. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, uh, questions here, and the first question on the chat. Uh, Alfredo says uh, your editing skills are pro as well as flying skills, so it's like watching a short movie. JT is asking, is ATP on your agenda and? Um, uh, yeah, great question. I get that question a lot. You know, Nico, will you go for the airlines? Um, probably not. I, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm already 50 years old, but that's not really the age thing. Uh, it's just uh, I'm, I already have a job. Uh, I have a full-time job with my business. And for me to actually uh, get out of that and change career paths altogether, that, that, that wouldn't, wouldn't work. But you know what? If I had chosen a, part, a career path uh, in my 20s, uh, aviation-wise, I'll probably be doing airline flying right now, most mm -hmm. likely. Yeah. Um, and I, I see somebody's uh, unmuted. Did you want to ask a question, Gabriel? So Mike is asking, why and how did you choose a Cirrus? Definitely. So, you know, just like everybody else, I used to fly the Cessnas and Diamonds and, and Pipers and whatever I could get, get my hands on before I started, before I bought the Miss Grace, my first Cirrus. Uh, the G2, um, but I, you know, people have all these preconceptions about about Cirrus. Oh, it's got a parachute, so it's probably not great, right? Why does it have a parachute? And uh, once I uh, got myself into, I'm like, I said to myself, okay, I'm I'm gonna go and fly Cirrus to see what this thing is all about. And once I sat behind the cockpit of that airplane, I fell in love with it. And that was, I believe, September of 2015. And in December of 2015, I owned my first Cirrus. Uh, so it was so instant. But I, and the, once I started looking into the CAPS parachute system and all that, and I, got the, I understood the philosophy behind it and I got educated about it, I said to myself, I will never fly another airplane again, ever. I, I just can't, you know. Um, so it completely changed my mentality from being a, um, very skeptical about it to being a, I'll be skeptical about flying anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, that's Did, it. Yeah. Asking, do you have plans to buy, uh, another or a newer 22? Yours is it's brand new. It's brand new. It's a year old. The 22 turbo 
uh, once I sold Miss Grace, um, then I, you know, I, uh, I, I knew I wanted to buy a, a turbo because of, you know, I wanted to take advantage of going higher, you know, with my long flights that I do, altitude is your advantage uh, most of the times so anyway, not always. But um, yeah, and, 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 and of course, I, you know, being a business tool, uh, the tax purpose was a great advantage. So um, and, and let me tell you that that worked out great, by the way. So yeah, yeah, and this is a brand new airplane. It's got about just about 350 hours on it, maybe close to 400 by now. Mm -hmm. So yep. Vince is asking, um, when are you buying the Vision Jet? Okay, interesting. I flew the Vision Jet in December, mm -hmm. I did a demo flight, and I actually was uh, really contemplating on putting it. You know, I do have a deposit for the Vision Jet actually, because when you buy a brand new Cirrus, you get the opportunity to buy a position for the jet for 50% off, which is a great investment because there's no way you can lose money. So I had the money and I said, listen, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put the money in there. If I don't ever make the move to actually buy the Cirrus jet, then you know, I'm just gonna sell the position. And I'm down the line really 640 some, or so, you know, so it's not another probably four years before I get it. So I flew the Vision Jet, it's a great airplane, but it's a lot of money, it's very, very expensive, very expensive to maintain, mm -hmm. it's a jet. So, you know, honestly, I, I love my Piston Cirrus. <laughs> I, I don't know, there's so much automation in that, that jet, it's almost like you're not even doing anything. It's, it's, it's just, right. you know, you know it, it's even more automated than anything else. So I don't know, I'm a little, I, I love the, the performance and everything, but, but I'm not sure I want to spend that kind of money, right? So. Exactly. Um, so uh, Mike is asking, did you look at some low end turbines or something pressurized? Pressurization is a big deal. Let me tell you, once you start flying with that oxygen in your nose for a while, uh, it, it's, you know, no matter what, it, it, it's a product. There's a lot of cables in the cockpit. It, it's although it's nice and streamlined the way they've done it with the Cirrus uh, Turbo, uh, it's still, I, I, you know, it would be great to have a pressurized airplane. Unfortunately, not too many piston pressurized airplanes out there that have a parachute. That's a problem, <laughs> you know? Murad so, in, uh, he wants to fly in Greece and he says, I watched your videos of flying in Greece and I can barely understand what ATC is saying. What can you advise besides validating my certificate? Anything to look, look out for? Okay, so flying in Greece is a challenge. It's very complicated airspace. Uh, it's very restricted airspace. So there's a lot of military uh, stuff going on there. Um, so it's, it's challenging. It's also expensive. Fuel is super expensive, probably one of the most expensive in Europe. And Europe is expensive already, um, but the destinations are just beautiful. Once you get to fly there, you just forget about all the difficulties prior to that. So uh, I would uh, hook you up with the uh, AOPA Greece and uh, my buddy uh, Kip. He's the president of that. And uh, whoever is interested in flying in Greece, I'll I'll hook you up with them directly and. You'll be uh, an ambassador about flying in Greece. It's getting better and it's getting um, uh, superb. And there's more and more airports, actually, the municipal airports that are opening up in Greece, uh, which is great. So, yeah. Now, because you have a turbo, you do a lot of higher altitude flying. Can you talk about some of the differences uh, having the turbo versus your experience having the non-turbo and, and you know, some of the pros and cons of, of that and high altitude flying and oxygen and everything else? Great. First of all, the turbo is much simpler than the uh, normally aspirator engine. Um, you don't need to worry about leaning as you're climbing or anything like that because you're turbocharged. So you're, the engine has all the, the oxygen it needs all the way to 25,000 feet. So you don't need to worry about any of that. You don't need to worry about high altitude performance. You don't need to worry, you know, you're in the mountains at, you know, 8,000 feet in summertime. You don't need to lean in order to go, uh, just full rich all the way and the airplane has all the power it needs, right? It's a turbo, it generates all the power 100% at any altitude or not, a, I mean, higher up, not exactly, but, but. Um, performance wise, it's pretty much the same as the non, uh, the normally aspirated. Um, and above 10,000 feet, it just takes off. That's where the turbos really show the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, oxygen is a challenge. You gotta make sure you have your oxygen tanks. You gotta, 
you gotta know that you know how long you're gonna be flying, how many people you're gonna have on board, and how long that action is gonna last you. There's a chart, and it's perfectly accurate. But you learn, so it's a challenge. The oxygen, you need to know that it works. You gotta check your your oxy uh, oxygen level, your your finger every you know 10, 15 minutes just to make sure that that you're there. Um, and uh, it's challenging, and you gotta know what you're doing. You gotta you gotta be trained and uh, but but uh, it's, it's a it's a great tool it's a great tool to be able to go above some of the weather you know and take advantage of the tailwinds yep and that when you're on oxygen uh you fatigue less than where you when you had miss grace and you could go on longer flights absolutely uh when i'm at uh, eight thousand feet now <laughs> i just put the oxygen on i'm like this is great because then three four hours later you land and you feel like you didn't even fly, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, has uh, Cirrus figured out the cause of your radio static? They have not, they have not. Uh, we don't know yet. We think it's just, you know, I have airline pilots telling me, Nico, this is normal. There's nothing you can do. Um, I don't know if I want to buy that, but uh, there's a lot of pilots out there that are basically saying that uh, this is something that's going to be happening. And, uh, but we'll see. We'll, we're still looking. It's very difficult to chase the problem because the mechanic needs to be able to experience it, to be able to test what's going on while it's happening. And how are you going to do that, right? Right. So. I think Danny unmuted himself. Danny, did you have a question? Okay, I guess not. All right. Um, and so Jason's asking if you were buying your first airplane all over, would you recommend buying turbo or NA, normally aspirated? Yeah, for my mission, turbo, right? Uh, every airplane has a mission. Everything goes back to the mission. Yeah, we can buy whatever we, if we have the money and all that. Uh, we can buy whatever we want, right? Um, but you need a tool, a machine that's going to fit the mission that you're flying. Uh, that's what you would look at. So for me, uh, just because of my mission, I absolutely, yeah, turbo, oh yeah, yeah all the way, all the way. Greatest thing. Um, Vincent's asking, how are you maintaining the engine during COVID uh, when flying hours have been reduced? Have your flying hours been reduced or are you still flying the same amount? Oh yeah. Flying hours have reduced tremendously just because there were no missions. There were no conferences to go to, no clients to go see, employees to go meet, no executive meetings, none of that. So the airplane has been kind of sitting idle, um, but I've been trying to fly a little bit once a week just to go up in the air to exercise the, the engine a little bit because it, it does need everything to just flow through and all that. Um, Maintenance-wise, there's no need right now because it, it doesn't even hit the hours that, that uh, it needs. So I'm still, I think, at like 20 hours out of 50 before the next oil change. And mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, looking at some other chat questions. If you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to and ask him a question. Let's see. One just came in here. Uh, okay. Uh, we just went over that. Uh, what is the true maintenance cost with the turbo, Mark is asking. All right, so interesting. Maintenance cost. Uh, well, to be determined. We don't know that yet, all right, because we haven't gotten there. Uh, the first annual maintenance was nothing. It was just 4500 bucks. So no issues, nothing, no nothing broken. Uh, everything warranty-wise is covered by Cirrus. There's been maybe a couple little things that were covered by Cirrus. Um, not much, really. So no, really no issues, but we don't know. We'll see, we'll see. I'll let you know as it goes forward. I, I do plan on putting together a video on operating costs. So since I had an entire year where I was able to actually operate the aircraft and we'll put everything together, including oil changes, you know, the annual maintenance, and then also financing costs, hangar, everything associated with the airplane. And uh, we'll make, try to make it entertaining, maybe involve Zoe a little bit in telling us the story of how much, how many uh, toys she could have had instead of uh, paying for daddy's airplane. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, 
do you find that having the aircraft is really a capital tool for you to expand your business and meet clients that you wouldn't normally have been able to do? Absolutely. Uh, it is an incredible tool to be able to utilize again, the things that you, you know, being able to do things that you cannot do with the airlines and have your own flexibility and being in full and complete control of your schedule. Uh, uh, it is an incredible feeling. I, I can't really describe it. Um, for me, I, I couldn't even, I haven't flown the airlines, except when I go to Europe. I don't fly the airlines anymore. I one step foot. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just wonderful, it's just great. But you gotta be able to have the mission, or, or if the mission is not there, you have to generate the mission. If that makes any sense, right? And if that doesn't make any sense, I'll be more like happy to take another question about what do I mean about that. So Charles is asking, uh, what was your maintenance cost for Miss Grace uh, versus uh, uh, now? Miss Grace was an old airplane, was a 2006 model, and uh, obviously had a lot of issues, just like any other, you know, older airplane over a decade. Um, a lot of maintenance costs. The annuals were ten, fifteen thousand dollars, just because there were a lot of things, a lot of things that I didn't want to leave them unfixed. A lot of things were not even airworthy items. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to put my family and and fly for business on an unreliable aircraft, right? In case something breaks down. So I wanted everything to be perfect. So I was spending quite a bit of money. Uh, and you know, anybody you're going to ask that has an older yeah. airplane. And you know, you too, I mean, the airplane is not new, so there's a lot that goes into maintaining it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. Oh, yeah. um, Alfredo, a serious owner um, is asking, I have a G2 and one of my frustrations is a relatively limited payload. Uh, the five and six models increased by 200 pounds. Many people say that they regularly fly the G1 through G3 above gross. Would you comment on that? I know I will. <laughs> Okay, so I will and then you will and then we'll compare notes, okay? So I'll tell you. <clears throat> First of all, you don't want to be flying an aircraft above gross, okay? But you can if you have to. It doesn't mean that the airplane is going to break. And I'm not saying that you should, but I'm saying that if the alternative is to start siphoning fuel out of the wings just to bring the load down, then maybe if you're just a few pounds overweight, Mm, it's okay, you, you know, it, it, can, it can take place, you know, it, there, there's ways around it. Um, I try to never fly overweight. And if I do fly overweight, it may be just a few pounds and I know I'm just going to be shedding them once I take off and, you know, within a few minutes. Um, good planning will get you to a point where you'll never have to fly overweight, you'll never find yourself in a situation where, where you're going to be overweight. Ask your passengers how much they weigh. It's perfectly fine to ask your passengers how much they weigh. Okay. Now, what, what about you, uh, Lawrence? What, what do you think? No, well, I have literally kicked off passengers uh, because they lied to me about their weight because, you know, you can tell when your airplane is overweight and just by walking outside and saying, you know, it's sitting a little bit different. And I remember having um, three heavier folks on board and the daughters lied about their weight uh, considerably. I said, okay, one of you has to leave uh, or we're gonna use the scale. And so one of them left. And uh, uh, so no, that's number one. Number two, um, in order for you to fly overweight, you actually have to get uh, uh, a special approval from the FA. So like when we ferry uh, the Cirruses to Hawaii, um, we have to fill out a special form because they, they have to take off over gross weight. Uh, in the case of uh, my G3, it was about 10% over gross on the takeoff, but it doesn't perform any good, you know, when it's uh, yeah. like that. Um, but no, you as a private pilot, student pilots that are on board here, you, you never fly overweight for one more reason. And that is that, God forbid, you're in an accident and they figured out that you flew overweight, you will not get insurance coverage. That is absolutely guaranteed. Right. That's right. That's right. And you're talking 10% overweight. That's 340 pounds, right? That's a lot of extra weight. You will never, ever want to do anything like that unless, as you said, you have the special permission and, and ferry flights. So yeah. um, let's see here. There's some more questions here. Um,
Okay. Yeah, we're, it's all pretty much on the weight issue here. Any other questions on any other subject here for Nico? What's your next mission, Nico, that you're going to uh, video? Next mission. Okay, so the next uh, video that is going to hit the, uh, YouTube this week uh, is going to be the return flight from New York City. Uh, that was back in October. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, the next ones, uh, and that's going to be interesting because it was up at altitude with oxygen on, and I got to stop at St. Simon's Island in Georgia for refueling. It was a very, very cold flight. I, I can't wait to start editing it because I kind of vaguely remember what happened. Then I have uh, a few flights um, uh, coast to coast from Florida all the way to California and some other cool videos. Uh, a lot of people have asked to do a pre-flight video, and I don't want to make it too geeky so i had uh zoe involved and she's doing the pre-flight and uh it's interesting so it's just going to be a fun video that we're putting together and i also have an interesting video that's coming up uh soon it's going to be a comparison of autopilots between an airplane a tesla car and a boat autopilot and that would be fun because all those different things work right so you know we'll see how that goes it, uh, i filmed the whole thing i just have to put it all together so. A, a few more questions are, are coming in here real quick here. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Gabriel's asking, what is the best year for a used Cirrus? The best year for a used Cirrus? I'd say something that is not more than five years old. <laughs> and there's reasons for that. There's reasons for that. The Cirrus, you know, the CAPS parachute, it has a 10-year expiration date. So after 10 years, um, you got to replace the whole thing, and it's uh, an expensive item. It's about 18 grand or so. I don't remember. It's even more, you know, no idea. And uh, so you definitely want to get a series that at least have a, uh, you know, uh, five years left on that caps parachute, or you'll be you'll be negotiating with a, with the seller on how to deal with uh, replacing a caps parachute since it's so expensive. So I'd say about five years old max, if you can yeah. afford it. That is. Yep. You know, I've. Personally, I've owned uh, now in my third uh, Cirrus, um, and I have found that it, it really just depends on so many factors from how the previous owner treated it to the ADs outstanding to the parachute, you know, has it been factored in or not in the uh, cost of the capital. Um, so, you know, there's some fantastic G1s that are really nicely priced, and there's some excellent uh, G6s that are coming on the used market now that are very nicely priced. So um, it, it, it's a, that's a loaded question. But, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, just apples to apples, um, obviously newer is better, especially if you have a warranty still on it. So sure. which, uh, sure. if, if that's available, yeah. that's even better. So, all right, a bunch of questions coming in here. All right. Um, okay. A uh, question about lightning protection. Uh, Santiago, I'm sorry, I missed that question. Um, you say that Nico may be able to answer. I'm not sure what that question was. Oh, is that about the mesh, the wire mesh that's around the fuselage of the aircraft? You want right. to make that? Right. Or? I mean, any kind of any kind of lightning protection. And thank you, Nico, for doing this. This is fantastic. Yeah, uh, there is a wire mesh uh, completely uh, around the aircraft uh, that's underneath the paint. So that's uh, for lightning protection. Uh, all right, let's see here. Um, do you own a Tesla Model X, Fred is asking. <laughs> I do, I do. That, that's brand new too, yeah. <laughs> a lot of serious owners own Teslas. You know, there, and there's a reason I think there's a correlation. We waste uh, the gas, the gas guzzler is the airplane. <laughs> there you go, that's right. <laughs> Lance is asking, do you follow a regular recurrent training program? I do. I fly with uh, instructors regularly, every chance I get, uh, every six months. Um, but I, uh, I also do the, uh, uh, the, the Cirrus online training. Uh, I find that to be a great way to remind me of certain things that, you know, you tend to forget. So I love that stuff. Uh, there's all sorts of content up there. Um, and, uh, I love getting, in, you know, uh, involved every three months or so. Yeah. Well, when you flew with me two years ago, we did that whole angle of attack, uh, video and everything. And it was fun. 